if we take a step back from the genetics, which we're all very excited about, uh, but for years, uh, we have also noted some uh, just differences under the microscope. And these tumors have been classified as well differentiated, as moderately differentiated, as poorly differentiated. And that's also something that's shifted over time. It, maybe Jennifer, can you sort of explain your view of how you think about tumor differentiation and the histologic classification of neuroendocrine tumors? Sure, so I think, um, first of all, it's, it's, it's important to take a step back and look at the primary site first and determine, you know, is this something of pancreatic origin versus of bowel origin? And then under the microscope, making the distinction between a well-differentiated tumor versus a poorly differentiated tumor is pretty significant because the treatment options are much different. In the well-differentiated population, we use agents, as James was alluding to, such as VEGF inhibition, mTOR inhibition, um, and uh, cytotoxic therapies based on primary tumor site. But in the poorly differentiated setting, we really only use systemic chemotherapy uh, and no targeted agents are, are useful in that disease. So I think that uh, you know histologically, we're learning a lot more over the past few years that, that there really is a difference, not just amongst well-differentiated versus poorly differentiated, but also amongst the poorly differentiated group of tumors that there's large cell and small cell and those may also not be the same disease entity. So if you if you're, have a patient in front of you and, and you're looking at the pathology report, what are the key things you look at to help you decide if this is well differentiated or poorly differentiated? So, um, so the first thing that I, that I look for is, is what the pathologist called it as, so well differentiated, moderately differentiated, poorly differentiated, and, and then to, to make sure that it's being classified as a truly well differentiated tumor versus a poorly differentiated tumor, I look at supplementary features such as the KI67 proliferative index and the mitotic rate to make sure that it seems that a tumor is really more in one class over another. And then again, the primary site is also critical. So you mentioned the, the KI67, which is the proliferative index. In your mind, what's sort of the, the cutoff that, that should be used or that is used? This is an area of controversy. Sure, right. So the, the current definition would, would say that a poorly differentiated tumor has to have a KI67 of greater than 20% up to all the way up to 100%, which is a very broad range. Uh, whereas the well and moderately differentiated tumors would be less than 20 percent. Um, and there's sort of this borderline in between where sometimes patients can have a well differentiated histology but may have a KI-67 that technically classifies them as a high grade or poorly differentiated tumor. Um, and so I think that gray area is, is a difficult, um, is the area of controversy that you're speaking yeah, of. It's hard to know these, these, these high grade, well differentiated tumors an emerging class and it's, it's tough to know what to do with those. James, do you know what to do with those patients? <laughs> <laughs> That's always a tough one. I mean, I think that sometimes the clinical features will help you. You know, if the patient's coming in and their 60% of the liver is replaced with uh, you know, the tumor and the LDH is a bit elevated and uh, you really want to treat the component that you cannot afford to left untreated. So even though sometimes there's some question, we may decide to go with a poorly differentiated regimen. But there's other patient that comes in that, you know, for example, we had one case recently where the patient, you know, three, four years ago had a, you know, I would say a grade two small bowel carcinoid resected uh, but uh, now it's back with a uh, metastasis, which got resected again, their or biopsy again got called uh, grade three or poorly differentiated, and they're just over the line, you know, KI 67, 30%. Now that's a patient, um, especially in setting a lower volume disease, uh, actually you'd like it to just follow the patient, observe, and the patient is fine. He, the tumor is behaving like a well differentiated tumor is stable. Yeah. So there's another, another way that people have classified these tumors uh, is whether or not they secrete hormones. And this, there's this term about functional versus non-functional tumors. I'm going to turn to Diane. Do you, do you treat these patients differently, whether they're so-called functional or non-functional? Is, is this a real difference? Absolutely. I mean, one of the first things I tell my patients when I see them, um, particularly when they have hormone secreting or functional tumors is that one, unfortunately, um, that's generally 
when they come to me in the stage four setting. Now there are functional tumors, for example, that start in the pancreas um, that can be resected for cure and those should go to the surgeon. But in the setting of a stage four uh, metastatic or hormone secreting functional tumor, um, my job is to control the disease but also maintain their quality of life. And some of these hormone secreting tumors can be quite debilitating. So we really need to get on top of those um, patients so that we can better improve their quality of life. Uh, unfortunately, many of them have come after being undiagnosed for many years and it can be very frustrating for them. Um, and so there's very different hormones that actually can be secreted depending on where the cancer started. So if the cancer, for example, starts in the pancreas or pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, those tumors can um, produce insulin, so they can actually have um, potentially life-threatening hypoglycemia. Uh, Pro-insulin, the derivative, so if you have someone with low sugar, you should think about insulin and pro-insulin. Uh, glucagon, which is pretty uncommon. Gastronoma, which can be, again, high morbidity with potential for severe ulcers. And then the rare um, VIPomas and some other very uncommon hormones. Um, those hormone sort of decisions as to what biomarkers I decide to take are really driven by the clinical symptoms that the patient comes into the office with. Um, in contrast, if the tumor starts sort of outside the pancreas or in um, typically the small bowel or certainly in the lung as well, um, those patients can have hormone secreting cancers that are traditionally uh, what we call the carcinoid syndrome. Um, we've thought that maybe it's serotonin, but in fact there's probably other um, tachykinins and other um, types of hormones that contribute to those um, carcinoid syndromes, which is also quite debilitating and those patients will have flushing and diarrhea as their main symptoms.